away Holding back the rage that burned his soul Good morning. This is Bill from Curious Cars on another, well, it's a fairly nice Florida, you know, whatever the hell day it is. It doesn't really matter. It's it's not bad out. Uh, it's uh, The humidity is kind of at a minimum, and the temperature is not chilly, but it's not too warm. You know, it's good. If it stayed like this all day, I'd be happy. Unfortunately, it's not. It's not going to stay like this all day. It's going to get hot and shitty and humid and tropical in no time, because right now we're going through this unseasonably warm weather uh, in early March, which is just an absolute shame. I don't know if any more winter is coming. Probably this is a lead into the horrors of summer, and uh, I'm I'm just going to be crappy and miserable from here on out. So that's all I want to say about that. Uh, there was a deer sighting this morning as I was pulling down the street. Uh, it was a big sucker. It was mean. It was ugly. It probably had giant teeth. And uh, I kept quiet and idled by it as it sort of walked in front of me. And uh, I let it sort of trail off into the wilderness. So that was a, you know, potential danger averted, which was fine. Um, I am a little bit loaded up on the anti-Soviet whiskey. I did a video yesterday that I didn't get to put up. I, I got jammed up yesterday, so it didn't happen, uh, where I explained the whole anti-Soviet whiskey thing, because, uh, you know, obviously the coronavirus has now completely vanished uh, from the uh, public discourse. It's not something we're going to be talking about anymore, apparently, and uh, masks are gone. Uh, you know, it just seems like that's uh, now yesterday's news, and instead we've got the Soviet. I understand they took back Chernobyl. Uh, which, uh, God bless them, I guess they can have it. Uh, so anyway, I'm uh, drinking the whiskey to fend off the Soviets for the moment. I don't really know how it connects, but it probably does, and I'm not taking any chances either way. So uh, we're going to keep doing that. And number three, I have today a 1976 Lincoln Continental Mark IV Cartier Edition. I am very, very excited about this, I have to say. Uh, you know, I've had to field a bunch of really stupid phone calls this morning, so uh, the sun is already out. It's already screwing up the... Uh, the, look at my shadow in the car. It's screwing up the whole video. I don't care. I'm just going to keep going in the hell with it. The sun can do what it's going to do uh, because that's what the sun does. So uh, we're just going to dive and leap and plug along right into this car. Uh, I've done a Mark III before. I had a beautiful one. I miss it, actually. One of the few cars in life that I miss. And uh, a couple of different Mark Vs, uh, a car that I also like very, very much. And I had always been under the impression that the Mark IV was a bit awkward. I, I, you know, that the styling wasn't as sharp and crisp as the Mark V and not quite as rounded and lovely as the Mark III. I now can say that I can be corrected. Uh, you know, until I experienced this particular car, uh, I did not love the Mark IV as much as I thought I did. Uh, but when I saw this thing, it absolutely blew me away and I started to get it. I started to understand what was going on. And uh, now I do who really like this car. I think it's not particularly photogenic. Uh, I think it looks much better in person when you're sort of witnessing it and experiencing it live uh, than it does in the photos and the video. But, you know, that's not the call that I'm going to make. So, long story short, I'm thrilled to 
have it. I'm really enjoying this car. Uh, it's in many ways one of the most fascinating cars I've had. And, I, you know, God knows I've had a bunch of cars at this point. They're all blending into each other. Uh, but this one has really stood out amongst standouts. And it's one of the few cars that I sort of get this crazy inkling to keep, which, of course, I won't because I have nowhere to put anything. I wouldn't be a good steward for any old car. Uh, but uh, the fact that I'm greedy about it uh, tells me that it's probably a pretty nice piece, or at least uh, a pretty cool piece. And uh, I have to say that I really do like this car. Um, let's get into it. So look, the 1970s, when this car came out, it came out, this is in 1976, uh, it was an incredibly hedonistic decade in many ways. And this Mark, or, you know, even the Mark series going on after this and before this, uh, was the correct car at the correct time. It just absolutely fit the era. Uh, you know, the personal luxury coupe has been, had become the really the chosen mode of transport. It's now all but vanished. It was replaced by the SUV. Uh, but uh, at the time, if you were somebody, you had a personal luxury coupe. And uh, man, did the mark fit that properly. Uh, bankers and lawyers, they drove Eldorados and Seville's. Uh, but if you owned a steakhouse or a nightclub or you were a pimp, you know, with uh, moderate success, uh, then you drove a Mark, and uh, you can see why as you get into it. Uh, in fact, Lincoln kind of won the day on that argument. The first Eldorado in the late 60s was, you know, it was almost a muscle car, but it was sporty. It was almost European. You know, it was a little bit subdued. And then the success of the Mark series for Lincoln uh, got very much noticed by Cadillac, and they started scrambling to pimp out the Eldorado. Uh, as time went on, so um, it, it really didn't work. I mean, you know, look, the Eldorado was terrific, but basically the Mark was where it was at in terms of what people at the time wanted. And from this Mark IV onward, which was very successful, uh, it just handily outsold the Cadillac. It wasn't even close. They sold a lot more uh, of these Marks than they did Eldorados. And uh, I think that's because uh, Lincoln had its finger on the pulse a little bit better than Cadillac did at the time. But, you know, how this incredibly gaudy and ostentatious car, and it is, I mean, there's no denying it. I mean, it is gaudy, and it is ostentatious, and it is full of wretched excess. How it confers class on itself and its owner is completely beyond me. I mean, when you look at it, you think, oh my God, the guy who owns this thing. But somehow it did. I mean, almost against the odds. Uh, it still uses Lee Iacocca's pretty cheesy formula of putting a Rolls-Royce grill on a Thunderbird, uh, which is a platform that uh, was shared with this car. Uh, the Thunderbird and the Mark rode on the very same platform. Um, but somehow, despite all of these sort of you know, gaudy and in-your-face accoutrements, the car managed to be classy both at the time and today. And, uh, you know, how it does that is just shocking to me. Um, you know, the Thunderbird's great, same platform, enormous car, but somehow the Connie has presence well and above it. Uh, in fact, the um, from the bottom of the window up, the Thunderbird is basically the same car. It's only the sheet metal beneath it that's different. Uh, but you put the two of them next to each other, and they're there's just no comparison. Uh, the Continental wins the day in terms of impact and class and uh, the way it looks. And, you know, kudos to Lincoln for that. Um, it was the... Uh, okay, well, I tell you what. I'm going to pause for a minute and back this car up because the sun is starting to kill me. So I'm going to get it into the shade and then we're going to pick it up again. So hold on one moment. All right, hopefully that's a little bit better. We've got some kind of heavy equipment rolling over there. Of course we do. Of course it came in and is making noise when we're trying to knock out a video here. Some people just have absolutely no um, concern for others, you know. It's just the way people operate these days. Uh, but anyway, look, the, the, the Mark series, the Continental Mark series, has been the flagship, or was the flagship, of the Ford Motor Company lineup during its entire production. Truly, the history of the Mark begins in earnest in 69, when Lee Iacocca 
came up with this harebrained idea to dress up a Thunderbird and make it a luxury coupe. And in fact, he was instrumental in ushering in the whole luxury coupe uh, obsession with the uh, United States through the 1970s. Uh, it's just, you know, something that he's given credit for. And while most of them sold were, you know, the, the lower end sort of mid-grade stuff like the Monte Carlos and Cutlasses and Thunderbirds, the pinnacle of the luxury coupe market, uh, you could probably pin on the Eldorado and, uh, and the Mark series like this one. And for good reason. I mean, they are truly luxurious items that were uh, pretty epic at the time. So, uh, but look, before we get into this car, this uh, particular one, uh, let's take a minute to look at 1976, the year that this ultimate personal luxury coupe would have cruised the streets and boulevards. Um, it was the bicentennial in America, our 200 year anniversary. Uh, it was 200 years of the United States kicking ass. Well, you know, mostly. And, uh, you know, we were all very caught up in it. Some of my earliest memories were of this. I mean, I think I was five years old at the time. Uh, I remember all the flag decorations. I remember the uh, yeah, sort of the official logo of the bicentennial that they put on all kinds of crap uh, and event, you know, events and advertising. I remember running around like an idiot with sparklers and little American flags that were probably made in Singapore or Taiwan. It was just, you know, something I remember as a kid. Um, I, there were a bunch of events and happenings that sort of celebrated it. Uh, Johnny Cash was the Grand Marshal of the U.S. Bicentennial parade uh, in Washington, D.C. Uh, that was, of course, attended by Gerald Ford and his wife, uh, and also Queen Elizabeth and Prince Philip, who must have been a bit sort of snooty about the whole thing, you know, uh, uh, a bunch of uh, colonial upstarts that uh, have created this thing. But um, yeah, God bless him. I'm trying to picture Queen Elizabeth and Prince Philip having a drink with Johnny Cash, and it just isn't clicking for me. It's hard for me to envision uh, the three of them having a having a conversation of any kind. Uh, you know, it's a bit of an America fuck yeah moment, to be honest with you. Um, later in the year, Jimmy Carter was elected, uh, which is a bit surprising to me, but, you know, whatever. I guess people were tired of Gerald Ford falling all over himself and, you know, the Richard Nixon thing had kind of weighed on everybody's soul. Uh, so they thought, okay, we're going to elect a good Christian guy. Uh, and he was. I mean, Jimmy Carter, by all accounts, is, is a fine man and a good man and, you know, a family guy and a proper guy. Uh, he was an incredibly shitty president, but it really didn't matter at the time. What America wanted was somebody who was kind of good. I don't think they figured that inflation would skyrocket and that we'd have a president talking about the malaise affecting the country and that they should probably turn their heat down and put on a sweater. Uh, this was not really the message that America wanted to hear. Uh, and of course, that led to the election of Ronald Reagan a few years later. Uh, also in 76, the Concorde, I think one of the coolest uh, little bits of aviation history, uh, it had its first commercial flight. It had flown, of course, before, uh, but the first time that it carried passengers, paying passengers in earnest, was in 1976. And two of them left simultaneously, one from Paris and one from London. Uh, the London one flew to Bahrain. Uh, I guess, you know, of course, everyone was spending that Arab money at the time. And the uh, Paris one went to uh, Rio de Janeiro. So uh, that was a pretty big deal at the time, and it was pretty cool. My dad was in the travel business, so I kind of remember all of that crap very much. Uh, the first space shuttle was unveiled. It wasn't launched or anything, but it was unveiled. And to the delight of Star Trek fans everywhere, uh, it was called the Enterprise. Uh, it also sort of gave away the nerdy, subtle desire of NASA engineers to fly off into space and fornicate with green women. So you probably had a little bit of that going on. Uh, serial killer news. You had the son of Sam in New York. He started shooting people at the behest of his neighbor's dog. And uh, of course, Fidel Castro became the uh, president of Cuba. Uh, you know, other than that, there really isn't that much going on. It's not really... 
a particularly eventful year. I mean, there was some kind of tsunami somewhere that killed 5,000 people, and, you know, there was this, that, all the usual stuff went on. Uh, but as far as standout news events, there just wasn't all that much in 1976, uh, which was probably fine by everybody at the time. They were probably a little bit tired of all the crap that had already gone on for the last 10 years or so. Uh, movies, you had Rocky, fantastic, you know, who didn't love that? Uh, you know, the, the terrific flick for everyone to enjoy running up the steps. I understand that uh, they moved his statue, that it used to be in front of that Philadelphia Art Museum, and uh, apparently Philadelphia became a little bit troubled by it. I don't know if they toppled it in protest, uh, but whatever they did, they moved it somewhere. And I think South Philly or something, and, you know, maybe the people there seemed to like it. Who knows? Um, you also had the Six Million Dollar Man, that was a favorite of my youth. I had the toys and action figures and some kind of blow-up control center. I kind of remember all that now. Uh, you had the Jeffersons moving on up. Uh, you know, you had a terrific show, which was a spin-off of uh, All in the Family, which of course you also had. Uh, you had MASH still going on. You had Good Times, um, Kojak. And I would be very negligent to not mention it was the final year for the TV show Cannon, uh, who was a very portly TV detective uh, who actually drove a Mark IV. So uh, there it is. The Mark IV was a TV star at the time. Uh, in music, you had Rod Stewart, you had Queen, um, Elton John was doing his thing, you had uh, Paul McCartney and Wings, I think they were running around, you had ABBA and uh, everybody's uh, eternal favorite, Barry Manilow. So that was the contemporary world of this Mark IV. That, that was what was going on, and frankly, it just wasn't much. So, uh, you know, the steakhouse owner or nightclub guy or pimp who was driving this thing wasn't terribly worried about world events. He was just doing his thing. He was probably annoyed at the price of gas, but, you know, the hell with it, because it was still cheap uh, if you're making a lot of money selling prime rib to people. And uh, everybody, for the most part, seemed to be fairly happy. And, uh, of course, uh, ladies' fashion was uh, still uh, quite pleasing to look at. So, uh, 76 was an interesting year. So, I tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to pause again because I need it. I'm going to have a sip of water and whatever the hell else it is I'm going to do. Maybe a little more anti-Soviet whiskey. And uh, then we're going to dive and leap directly into this particular car, starting with the exterior styling. So, hold on for one moment. All right, so let's ignore the sound of the stupid bucket front end loaders over there and just get on with this thing. Uh, Ford threw everything that it had in the personal luxury coupe uh, bullpen at this car. Everything. I mean, it just, Ford, they went absolutely nuts. I mean, it got more than six feet of hood. More than six feet. It's insane. Uh, it got hideaway headlights. It got the Rolls Royce grill. Um, you know, even the five mile an hour bumpers on this car, which look a bit silly on the midsize and smaller cars that were contemporary of this, you know, when they first came out, they almost look normal and proper on this car because of its enormity. Uh, it's, <laughs> it's just a big car. Um, it got uh, a large upright hood ornament, absolutely enormous. Uh, you see the knife-edged fenders protruding beyond the hood uh, into a set of very attractive-looking parking lights. Uh, this one has these optional and expensive forged steel wheels, uh, which um, are kind of cunningly designed to look like hubcaps but aren't. Uh, look at the ornate trim running around the um, impact strip of the car. Uh, everywhere you look, it's just absolutely absolute insanity. Um, you've got this enormous chrome trim surrounding the greenhouse. Uh, you've got chrome mirrors. You've got chrome inset door handles. You've got opera windows. Uh, and we'll get into this in a minute. This one is a Cartier edition. 76 was the first year that Link had brought the designer series in. And uh, this is kind of cool being a Cartier. Uh, you get a continental hump at the back, you know, the spare tire hump. They had to move the taillights up from the bumper to 
accommodate the big uh, five mile an hour things. You've got dual exhaust at the back. Uh, you've got a vinyl top. Basically every Mark IV had one. This one is a quarter top or half top because it has a sunroof. And it just is an enormous and insane looking car. Um, and again, this was the first year of the designer series uh, where Ford decided that they could make extra money by having, they had four different designers come up with their own styles and patterns for the Mark IV, colors, materials, that sort of thing. Uh, you had Emilio Pucci, uh, you had Bill Blass, you had Cartier, and you had Givenchy. I'm sure I'm saying that wrong. Uh, but anyway, that would continue for many, many years and become a shtick of the Mark series and, and some other Lincolns as well, uh, where they had the uh, designer nameplates on them. Uh, against all odds, it came off as very classy. Uh, even today, I think it does, without, uh, without question. Um, it's just amazing to me. Uh, in so many ways, this is an impossible car. It's just impossible. Uh, you know, like, unlike today, there's this vast palette of colors to choose from. I mean, like a dozen of them. I mean, today you get like four or five different colors, two or three interior colors. Not so with the mark of the time. You could customize this thing to your own taste. And in fact, that showed up in uh, Ford advertising at the time. They, you know, you can create your own mark. Uh, you could uh, order different colored impact trim on the side. You could order, you know, the leather velour inside with different materials. You could uh, order the color of your quarter top and you could make the mark look like the way that you wanted to. Even some of that was available on the designer series. Um, there, it's just something that could never be built today. I mean, there is so much wasted real estate on this car. Uh, look at the hood on this thing. I mean, it shows up in a different time zone before you do. Uh, the, you know, the interior actually seems a little bit small uh, given the uh, dimensions of the car. Detroit would never do this today. Uh, it's the absolute height of personal wretched excess and it's done in the most wonderful of ways that it actually works and you actually kind of like it uh, just nothing like it could ever could ever come out of Detroit in the modern era and I think that's a very big part of this car's appeal I, I really really do so I tell you what let's dive into the trunk and see what we got I love the Continental uh, bulge at the back. You see it's still got the original original paint on this car. A very brief note about this car. When I, you know, bought it and I paid a ton for it because I was absolutely in love, it is one of the most honest and original cars that I have seen in a long time. Uh, it's, uh, it, I think it has two owners. You know, the story was it was a one-owner car, but I don't believe it. I found some reason to indicate that it isn't. But I have a feeling it was bought almost as like a CPO car back in the day uh, by, um, you know, some husband and wife, and it was the woman's car, and I think she absolutely went nuts for it and kept it for, what is this car, 46 years old? I bet she's had it for more than 40 of them, and uh, finally she got too old to drive and gave it up, but you'll see what I'm talking about as we go. Uh, anyway, so you can get into the trunk by doing this sort of standard flip up the continental badge thing. I like that it has a reflector in it. More bling for the car, more chrome trim around the bottom of the trunk. And uh, you do have an enormous trunk. I mean, you're going to be able to fit all kinds of crap in here. Never mind your infants and toddlers. You can fit you know, I don't know, look, whatever. Whatever it is you need to take with you, it's going to fit inside the trunk of this car. I also like the way that they've lowered the uh, access point a little bit, so you don't have to unlug it over the top of a big um, ledge to get it in there. Uh, it's very nicely finished, carpeted. Uh, I think it's kind of silly that it's got a spare tire hump at the back and the spare tire is actually up at the front, but you know, that was the era. And uh, inside the trunk, everything looks good, proper, and nice as it should. I do like the quarter top as well, and you know, there's the Cartier uh, script inside these little opera windows, which these were actually the first marks to have opera windows, which then would go on to be a part of the Mark series for a while. Uh, this really irritates the hell out of me. You actually have to have the key inserted into the hood pull and there's no way to just leave it unlocked. You have to do this every time, and it's incredibly annoying. I mean, what the hell is anyone going to steal? Was crime really bad in the 70s? 
Thought it got much worse later on, but anyway, let's have a look under here. Oh God, that's heavy. And I mean, the length of that hood. I mean, they have to use like the springs from a dump truck to be able to hold that thing up. Uh, but here it is. And look, again, you know, I know this engine is not like something out of the Ford brochure. It shows wear, it shows, you know, we got some corrosion here coming off this. Got it on the uh, water neck and whatnot. But here's what's so unusual to me about this car is that it is 100% original. Uh, this was just a driven car that was owned by people who maintained it and never gave it up. And everything that you see in here is the way that it came from Ford. Uh, you still have stickers on the valve covers. You still have, you know, everything set up the way that uh, the car was. Uh, and the engine, this, this is a giant part of the appeal of this car. 460 cubic inches. Obviously, by 1976, it had started to suffer from, you know, malaise and emissions and didn't quite have the horsepower and torque of uh, the ones that came out before it. But it was still plenty. I mean, you just, I mean, you take a car with this many cubic inches, you can't really tone it down enough to matter. Uh, it may not be a race car, but the way that this engine silently and smoothly motivates this 5,000 pound car down the road is awesome. It's just an awesome, awesome thing to behold. And uh, I do love driving it. Uh, every Mark IV had the uh, bulletproof C6 three-speed automatic. Uh, up front, you had uh, wishbones and coil springs, which again, I can only imagine the rating on the springs. Uh, in the back, you had leaf springs uh, and a live axle. Uh, I don't know if this one has it, and I think it does. It actually appears to with all of those uh, hoses coming off the back of the... Uh, off the back of the master cylinder in that pump there. Uh, optional on these cars, carried over actually from the Mark III, was uh, I think they called it Sensa Brake or something. Uh, the car actually had a very early ABS system at the back brakes, so um, skid control, whatever you want to call it. Uh, pretty much ahead of its time and I think in line with just how expensive and fancy these cars were in their era. So pretty, pretty neat stuff. The 76 Lincoln uh, essentially has ABS at the back. Uh, it's, and of course front discs, uh, rear, the, the later marks had um, uh, disc brakes at the rear. I don't think the Mark IVs did, but you can tell I really did my research. But. Anyway, there it is. Everything incredibly nice and original under the hood. To me, that and all original. This is the kind of car that you would have found on a used car lot in like 1979, you know, and been uh, you know pleased with the condition of it. The fact that it exists in this condition today is just incredible to me. Uh, it really shows just how. Uh, you know, these people stored this car. And I don't think that's entirely unusual. I think a lot of people uh, looked after their marks. I think a lot of people loved them. They were really the last of the true American behemoths. I mean, massive, massive dinosaurs. And, uh, you know, the people of that age who saw all these little front wheel drive or smaller rear drive cars coming thought, you know what? Uh, maybe we'll replace it. Maybe we'll have something else to drive daily, but we're going to hang on to our mark. And uh, that's why there's a pretty nice selection of these cars around today. Uh, people loved them, and they kept them, and they kept them nice. So, uh, again, I tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to pause. I'm going to get my crap together, get my crap inside the trunk. Then we're going to hop in, do the interior, and go for a test drive. So, uh, bear with me for one moment. All right, let's do it. You know, one of the things that's unusual about this car are these big fender flares. Very popular at the time uh, were fender skirts at the back, you know, that would cover half the rear wheel. Uh, the flares, the way it shoots out the side of the fender there, uh, precludes that on these cars. You know, they're designed to have full opening uh, wheel wells at the back, and that's part of the look, and that's the only look you can have. And that was a little bit unusual at the time, and uh, I think it's kind of 
cool. Uh, and it's particularly interesting considering the inset of the wheels. I mean, there's like, you know, a foot of space before you get to the outside of the tire, which was not unusual for the time. A lot of cars have that, but uh, of course now the look is where the wheel and tire is pushed out almost to the lip of the um, of the wheel well. And, uh, you know, I think actually this car would look kind of good with spacers if you pushed out the wheels a little bit, but yeah, this is the correct thing. Now, I don't know if Uncle Johnny is rubbing off on me. You know, he has this absolute obsession with originality, Johnny. He doesn't want to fix anything other than, you know, okay, if it needs a mechanical this or that. But he would never, I mean, he would no sooner like paint a fender because it had a scratch in it than he would, you know, poke his own eye out. It's just the way he is. And I don't know if that's the way that it should be or if he's rubbing off on me or there's just something about the state of this particular car that makes me want to preserve it as a piece of history. I know that sounds a bit grandiose, but I can't help it because it's just so damn unusual. Uh, the car has entirely original paint front to back. I didn't detail it. It's just the way somebody did. I mean, it shined up obviously, but it's the way it came in. The wheel are original, the bumpers are original, the top, everything, and of course it has flaws. But I don't necessarily want to fix them, and that is incredibly unusual for the way that I have conducted my affairs for the last 30 years. I mean, you get a car in as a dealer, you know, you fix the little buyer objections, we call them. You know, if it has a ding, you take a ding out. If it needs a bumper painted, you do that. You have a trim guy touch up the wear on the seat or the, you know, wear on a door panel. I've done none of that to this car and it doesn't really cost anything, you know, and, but I just don't want to. I just want to leave this car as sort of a statement of, of 46 years of just very incredible ownership and maybe you'll get what I'm talking about as we go so anyway let's hop into this thing Okay, so inside, these cars are all luxurious. They shared nothing of the Thunderbird, even though it was basically the same platform. You have all this deep pile carpet. Uh, you could get leather or velour. You could get a wide variety of colors and materials. And uh, all of it was uh, very, very luxurious. Uh, this door pull and this patina on the door panel is kind of an example of what I'm talking about. You know, I could have a guy come in and very, very professionally dye this armrest. You'd never know it at any patina at all. I don't really want to. I mean, this is 46 years of light wear from an elbow. I think it speaks to how the car was kept, and I just don't want to change it, and I don't know what the hell is the matter with me. Uh, ditto this thing. You know, I looked on eBay, and they have these little door poles in good shape, probably the ones that were on passenger doors. I think you just pop off these covers. They screw in. If it's the wrong color, I have my trim guy paint it, but I, I just decided to let it be what it is. You know what? If, if you think I'm crazy, say it in the comments. Say if I should go ahead and fix this kind of stuff. But to me, it just kind of adds to the original patina of the car. And um, I just, I don't know. I just kind of want to leave it what it is. Uh, in the back seat, your Canadian, this is an interesting thing, by the way. Uh, you could hear it when the door closes, it clicks. So when the door closes, there's a little a solenoid down in the back of the seat that will prevent it from reclining. The seat won't recline. It'll get clicked into position. Uh, you open the door, it clicks, and it releases that. Let's see if we can hear it. Yeah, I don't know if you heard it, but there it is. Uh, that's a really neat feature that was on these marks. Uh, the back seat, you know, nice friendly. Your Canadians couldn't be any happier. You've got all this button tuft of leather everywhere. Uh, you got room for... That's another thing these cars had was room for six. Not unlike a modern SUV, which is, I presume, why they you know, were what they were at the time. Uh, you can see the opera windows they'll be able to look out of. They have a little center armrest if there's just two of them. And uh, everyone's going to be pretty chipper back there. They already... And they have the ashtrays. This car has three of them. They've got these ashtrays on the back of the rear door panel if they want to keep smoking. So, all right, let's hop in. Oh, God. Anyway, we'll see. I don't know. Maybe I will fix these few little things, but I just feel like it's a shame to change it from the condition uh, that it's been maintained to for all of these years. 
by Shirley H. Summivan, who put her initials on the door as well. And uh, this is not, to me, an original Cartier plaque. Uh, it doesn't look like him. I think she had that made. It probably replaced one that was on there. Uh, but I get the feeling that she has owned this car for a very, very long time. And uh, was probably a really nasty and horrible woman to be around. All right, there's that 460 firing to life. And it doesn't rumble. It's absolutely, I mean, the car has new exhaust, which I'm sure is just factory exhaust, you know, refreshed. Uh, it's as quiet as a Lexus going down the road or sitting at idle. Uh, you can hear that it's running, but that's about it. And I think that, again, is part of the magic of this car. Um, you know, these were all well equipped, even as base models. But of course, you could inflate your ego and inflate your sticker price by opting for a bunch of different stuff. And the, the Cartier editions like this one tend to get it. So you've got automatic lights and automatic dimmers. That was an option. Down there you've got your climate control, automatic, all very nice. Your electric de-icer, uh, which works fine. I used that this morning. Uh, you've got a Cartier clock, which is working. It's actually one of the first marks that I've had the Cartier clock working in. You don't have to have a Cartier to have the Cartier clock. That was a thing that uh, other marks had. Uh, you've got your fuel gauge, probably your most important gauge because that thing goes down fast. <laughs> they have to keep an eye on that. Uh, there you see 70,000 original miles on the car, which is accurate, and uh, 120 mile an hour speedo. And I do love the square cluster and the square theme. I think it looks great. And I love the expanses of fake wood. Uh, you've got a battery of warning lights here. You've got low fuel, alternator, engine, door ajar. Don't know. This one maybe is just a blank or it's wore off. You've got brake and fasten seat belt. You've got your wipers and washers here, which is an odd place for them. Uh, one of these giant 70s cigar lighters. And uh, then the optional quadraphonic uh, AM FM stereo, which sounds terrific. And in fact, I've taken the liberty of putting a eight track in here. We got some Bobby Bear. Let's see how this works. Yeah, fantastic. Even the sound is great, even by modern standards. Uh, you know, the eight track, I will admit, sounds a little bit um, down, but when you play the radio, it sounds incredible. Uh, you know, you can tell that Ford put some dollars into that stereo system. Uh, you got an ashtray here, you got your power antenna switch down there, all very nice. Uh, up here you've got some uh, 70s cocaine mirrors, well, uh, maybe they weren't doing it then, but probably on both sides, so uh, surely could powder her nose depending on where she was at. And uh, this very nice option with the sliding partition, this huge power glass sunroof, which uh, is still working pretty great. And when you open it up, it's friggin' enormous. It's like one of those convertible football stadiums that can let in the outside air. Uh, dash looks great. You got more wood script over here. This, uh, even though I don't believe that's the correct one, there was a factory uh, badge that uh, people could have engraved with their name on it, the original owner. You got your Continental Mark IV script. Uh, here in the glove box, you have a wide variety of ownership documents that are still with it. Really nice to see in the original Ford bag. This woman was a monster. What else do we have? We have a trunk release. That was an option in this car. Uh, you got power seats over on the passenger side. Uh, it also came with this uh, modern Lincoln folder, but it's all full of the um, historical service. Look at this thing. I mean, that's a... That, you know, <laughs> That is from a long time ago. What year is that? 95. Actually, it looks older than that. But anyway, you've got a uh, long history of service records on the car, uh, which is pretty neat to see. And again, it just speaks to ownership. Let's see who owned it in 95. Maybe it wasn't Shirley some of them. That was Ron something. Eh, maybe that was her husband. Who knows? What we got over there? brake fluid. Anyway, it's nice to see a big selection of service records with a car, and uh, this one is no exception. 
All right, I'm not going to bother with my seat belt because it's the 70s and who cares. Uh, one thing that's neat is you've got these little quarter windows here. I call them smoker's windows on the Mark V, but on this car, not so much because the high dashboard sort of conflicts with it. I mean, you really would have to have the, um, uh, the eye-hand coordination of a biathlete to get in there and flick a cigarette ash out without, uh, you know, getting it inside the car. So you probably have to lower the rest of the window. That goes up and then it runs the little window after it. Uh, you also, of course, power mirrors here run this side and uh, you got one for the other side. So, you know, the equipment is just absolutely awesome. Uh, I'm going to put it on uh, auto. Let me get the fan on low. There we go. Hopefully it's, it's a little bit loud for a low fan, I have to say. Right, I'm going to turn that off. It's just a little bit too loud. I'll suffer for a minute till we get going. Look at the vista of this car with those giant knife-edged fenders, uh, you know, coming up on either side of the hood. You've got this enormous stand-up hood ornament, and you're looking at six feet in front of you. I mean, it is insane. Uh, when you turn this car, and frankly, cornering is not really its thing. It's not as bad as you'd think, but, you know, it ain't built for it. The front end turns before you do. Uh, <laughs> I mean, never mind. When you arrive somewhere, the front end arrives before you do. I mean, it is the longest hood. It's even that Monte Carlo from the 70 it had the longest hood in GM history. I suspect this is longer, and uh, it is um, it is quite a sight to behold. Oh, it also has cruise control on the wheel, and uh, I don't like doing this because it's hard one-handed, but it does have, uh, ah, for the love of God. I'm not going to... There we go. Okay, so it's got tilt wheel as well. Uh, again, more options for the car that are quite nice. Let's see how Dalton did on the windshield. I did have him polish up that for me yesterday. Yeah, I've seen worse out of him. It's not good, but I've seen worse. Let's get past these people. And steering-wise, and I know I've said this before, but if you try to, like, steer this car... Uh, it's not going to work for you. It's really not how it works. You, you just end up driving into a ditch. You have to navigate this car the way that you would the Queen Mary. Uh, you use that stand-up hood ornament as sort of a point of reference, and you stare, you know, a mile down the road and try and sort of just make minor course corrections towards that. I can see why these people put compasses on their dashboards back in the day, because frankly, it was just easier to steer using a compass uh, than it was to try and make it, you know, hug the road. Uh, this car just cruises the boulevard like nothing else. I mean, you've got 5,000 pounds flattening the road. It's fantastic. You've got over-assisted power steering that you can do with your pinky on this very thin, uh, you know, wood inlaid steering wheel. Um, you know, you've got power brakes. Man, you know, the ABS, they sure do seem to lock up. But they work fine, uh, you know, the car stops in a straight line very quickly. And um, it's just a terrific cruiser. Uh, and the big V7, the 460 just motivates this car. Even this malaise 460 is probably putting on like 225 horse, uh, maybe 100 uh, extra, you know, foot pounds of torque, like 325 or something. Uh, it still just motivates the car fine. And it does it quietly and lovely and it becomes a big part of the joy of driving this thing uh, is that you've got this giant torquey V8 uh, that lets you just use quarter throttle and go down the road with no effort at all. Uh, it eats up interstate like a whale sucking up plankton. It's nothing for it. I mean, these cars are so at home on the interstate, it's ridiculous. And I think it's a big part of what makes them a fun modern collectible. Uh, I mean, they may not fit in your garage, so that's kind of an issue. You know? <laughs> They are enormous, but you know the parts are cheap and they're out there. They're, I mean, you need basically anything for the mechanicals. Uh, it's available at you know AutoZone. It's not really hard to find, and they built enough of them that there's a wide variety of used parts out there, and there's enough of an enthusiast base that keeps them going, and uh, you know helps each other keep them going. So uh, it's a very very rewarding collector car to own, and frankly, you can get very very nice ones for far, far less 
you know, than any of the 69 Camaros or Chevelles or GTXs or Roadrunners or, you know, Mach 1s. All, you know, this car, you can get an extremely fine example for what you'd get into a pretty shitty 69 Camaro for. And that's another part of its charm. And people love it. When it goes down the street, even kids who had no concept cars could look like this are just amazed by it. And uh, older guys who experience them love seeing them on the road. So so um, there are very few cars in the collector world that are as friendly and lovely to have as these big marks. So anyway, look, I'm not going to keep rambling on. We're coming up to red lights. Give you a little bit of a kick down from that 460. God, do I like driving these things. I really do. You know, you do this enough, the thrill of cars sort of uh, vaporizes a little bit, but then you get a car like this and it takes you back and it reminds you of why you got into this business in the first place. So I really just absolutely love it. Uh, anyway, thank you very much for having a look. Really, really appreciate it. And uh, we got more fun stuff coming up. I don't know if I'm going to put this car up first or the one I did yesterday. So if you see a video coming out where I talk about it being a Wednesday and it's like a Tuesday, well, you know what happened. Uh, but uh, yeah, we'll see. We'll see. When I say, well, who knows? That's part of the part of the mystery that keeps life happy. So, uh, thanks again, and we will see you soon with something else. Take care.